Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. As we look forward this Advent Sunday to that great coming in glory of our King, let's stand together and sing hymn number 177. God, we praise you. God, we bless you. God, we name you Sovereign Lord. 177. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our Lord and Father, we draw near your throne this morning, reminded by the words we've just sung of who you are and what a thing it is to come into your presence together. You are the maker of heaven and earth and all creation, visible and invisible, displays your glory and might. You're the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, begotten before all worlds, God of God, and light of light, and one with you. And yet this, Lord Jesus, eternal God, stooped down from heaven in time and space for us men and our salvation. He took on flesh, was crucified, suffered and was buried and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures he ascended into heaven where he sits at your right hand 
and one day he shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. And you, Father, are the sender of your Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who spoke by prophet and apostle, that though cold in heart and dead in sin, we might know you. We marvel, Lord, and rejoice that through your Spirit you would bring us into the life and the love you share with your Son. And so we ask that as we open the Scriptures this morning, looking back to the triumph of the Lord Jesus and looking forward to his coming again in glory, you would send that same spirit to speak life-changing words today. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility so that on the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we might rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and ever. Amen. Well, let me give you a very warm welcome to the Tron Church this morning. It's lovely to have you with us, especially if this is your first time visiting us. This morning, our senior minister is away, uh, helping out with a gospel partner church. So it's a real pleasure to have Bob File preaching again. And having survived his series in Jeremiah, Bob's keen to remind us that he does occasionally enjoy the odd bit of New Testament. So this morning, he'll be opening up the book of Hebrews for us and looking at a great Advent text about the two comings of the Lord Jesus. Before we read it, though, just one or two notices this morning. Firstly, congratulations are in order to our member, Donnie Campbell, who's got himself engaged to an Edinburgh girl, Rachel Miller. I'm sure you'll be looking out for Donnie and Rachel and praying for them as they bridge the Glasgow-Edinburgh divide. Uh, it's lovely also to welcome back Charles and Anne Alford, who finally arrived home from Chingelo School in Zambia, where they've served for many years. I'm sure they'll be excited about starting a new phase of ministry here with us, but also looking back to the work they've left behind. So do be praying for them as they settle into new roles in Glasgow and back into the fellowship. And lastly, you'll have noticed that our Christmas leaflet uh, was on your seats this morning. If you open this up, you'll see that it does far more than simply tell people about our various service times. On the inside, you'll find a beautifully written testimony by Al Simpson, one of our medical students, about how he was drawn through real and sincere doubt to trust the truth about the Lord Jesus. So do take a big handful of these to give away to your neighbors and friends. Perhaps they're just looking for a nice carol service to come along to, or Perhaps they think Christianity is nothing more than a cult for weak-minded people. Either way, it could just be that what Al's written in here will give them pause for thought and a chance to think again about the claims of Christmas. And let's be praying for each other for boldness in inviting friends to church and to carol services and making the most of the season. You'll see on the back that this Saturday at 2 p.m. is our first Christmas event. Ruth's Choir are putting on a concert for us. There's no easier invite, is there, than to a carol service or a Christmas concert. So maybe you could come along to that and bring a friend with you. Well, we meet again this evening at 6.30 when Edward Lobb will be preaching. And sadly, that will be our last evening in the book of Judges for this series at least. So if you've enjoyed the tent pegs and the bowels and the bees as much as I have, then do come along to one last visit to the nation without a king. Now, though, let's turn to God's word for this morning. And our reading is Hebrews chapter 9. It's on page 1006. I'm going to read verses 15 to 28. Page 1006. Page <clears> 
Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it's not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundations of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having, been, having appeared once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. And as we respond to what we've just read, let's stand together and sing one of the loveliest carols of them all. It's a poem which Christians have been singing together with joy since the fourth century. Isn't that breathtaking? Of the Son who is eternally begotten of the Father's heart of love. Number 371, of the Father's heart begotten.
Now we have a break for a few moments as the offering is taken up. Now let's pray together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and of truth. Father, how we praise you for the light that came into the world, for the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never been able to quench it. And how dark our world is, Lord, as we look around. And we thank you that among all the great changes, among the unfolding of events, you are in control. Sometimes these great conflicts are at the head of our television news. Other times they are, they are in the background. Well, you remember the killing fields of the world. Remember the continuing tragedy in Iraq and in the Middle East. We remember the remember places where people hate each other so much, where people cannot live peaceably together, and where indeed places where people do not want peace but want violence and bloodshed, provided that their own ideologies can be thrust upon unwilling people. Lord, we know that only when the Prince of Peace returns will there be true peace in this world. And yet we pray at this time of Advent that that light will dawn in many hearts, that many who do not know you will come to know and love the, the son of David, great David's greater son, and that peace will reign in their hearts and in their lives and in their homes. Pray for the various services to be held here and in other churches throughout the, throughout the coming weeks. And pray indeed that as the carols are sung and the message is spoken, that people's hearts may indeed be touched. And Father, we, we, pray, for, we pray for our, our fellowship here. We pray for Willie helping out at one of our partner churches and pray that that, that experience will be a blessing. Thank you for Charles and Anne Alford joining us. We thank you for the fellowship we had with them a year ago when they were here, and now that they are coming to settle, we 
pray, Lord, that in these early days they will, they will find, find settling down a comfortable and blessed experience. You will bless Charles as he takes over responsibilities at Cornhill, and you will bless Anne as she looks for work, and we look forward to their fellowship and friendship in the days to come. And indeed, Lord, for each of us, in this week we have begun, and each of us face problems, each of us have joys and sorrows, each of us um, look to you in a way that we look to no one else. And so we pray, Lord, who alone can order the unruly wills and affections of sinful people, grant to your people that we may love what you command and desire what you promise, that amid the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are to be found, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now, before we look at the Hebrews passage, we're going to sing again, this time 353, a fine hymn by Margaret Clarkson, who is one of the, one of the really great hymn writers, I think, of recent times, who has both got a poetic touch and also very deeply powerful theology. 353, earth gave him no welcome, no shelter, no home. He slept in a stable. The inn had no room. Number 353. <clears throat> Now, if we could turn again, please, to page 106 to the Hebrews passage, Hebrews chapter 9, and let's have a moment of prayer before we, before we look at the passage. Father, as we turn from the praising of Your name to the preaching of Your Word, 
we ask that you will take my human words with all their limitations, that you will use them faithfully to unfold the written word, and so lead us to the living word, the Lord Christ himself, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Man shall live forevermore because of Christmas Day, says the carol. No, he won't, says the Bible. He'll live forevermore because of Calvary, because of the resurrection, because of the ascension, because of the sending of the Spirit and the coming of the Savior on the last day. We must not separate the two comings. We must not divorce Christmas from the rest of the story as if it had nothing to do with the big story. It's hugely significant, of course. The, these stories in Matthew and Luke of the coming of the Savior are among the most beautiful, moving, and powerful stories in the world. But when the early church celebrated the season of Advent, it wasn't primarily as the build-up to Christmas. It was rather a reminder that the coming to Bethlehem pointed forward to the coming in the last days, which will culminate in the, in the prince coming to reign. At the first coming, the young prince of glory landed incognito behind the enemy lines, met the serpent dragon of Genesis 3, and gave him a deathly blow. But that was only the first part of the process, if you like. And when he comes again, as we've just sung, he will not be coming incognito. He will come in glorious majesty. And my title today is Coming in Great Humility and in Glorious Majesty. That's taken from the words of the great English reformer, Archbishop Cranmer, in his Advent Collect, which Rupert used in his opening prayer, which talks about our Savior coming in great humility and on the last day, coming in His glorious majesty. And we're going to look at this Hebrews passage, particularly the last few verses, which focus that very powerfully. This is not the beginning of a series, though I'm hoping to begin a series on Hebrews in the Sunday evenings of the new year. Uh, it's, some people, as Rupert says, wonder if I know there is a New Testament in the Bible, and this is a helpful reminder that I do, although I suspect when we start on Hebrews, it will be the same as what happened with Revelation a few years ago. You'll end up thinking Revelation is in the Old Testament <laughs> um, and Hebrews. By the way, I wish this is never going to happen. I wish I could persuade people to call this book the Scriptures. That great expositor, Alec Matir, said, if you'd said to Jesus, what do you think of the Old Testament? He would have looked puzzled for a moment, and then said, oh, you mean the Scriptures. But I don't know why you call them that. Anyway, this is bringing together the great event of the coming in great humility to Bethlehem and the coming uh, in glory at the end of time. Hebrews is a book about the last days. It begins, God who spoke to our fathers by the prophets, as in those last days spoken to us in His Son. And the last days is the whole period between the comings. I want to ask two very basic questions. First of all, why did He come the first time? And secondly, why will He come again? And we're going to say particularly concentrate on the last few verses of the chapter. We had to read quite a bit more in order to give it context, but uh, I'm going to concentrate particularly on verses 23 to 28. Why did he come the first time? Now, there is no book in the New Testament that shows more how staggeringly new this event was as God invaded time and space. This is not a prophet. This is not a messenger. This is not an apostle. This is God Himself becoming human. And yet, no book shows us more powerfully how it fulfilled the Old Testament, how it fulfilled the Scriptures, how we cannot fully appreciate what Christ did if we confine our reading and thinking to the New Testament. The background of this passage here is the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. Christ entered, verse 24, not into the holy places made with hands, 
but into heaven itself. Now, now in the, the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, we read about the Day of Atonement, which was essentially a kind of spring cleaning almost. All the sins of the year brought and laid before the Lord by the high priest as he went into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, the third division of, of the tabernacle and then the temple. Only he was allowed to enter it and only once a year. And he made atonement there with the blood of bulls and goats for his own sins and for the sins of the people. There would be anxious moments as the people waited for the high priest to reappear. After all, his two sons, if you read the earlier part of the book of Leviticus, had barged into the holy place, the most holy place, offered what was essentially Egyptian sacrifices, and were destroyed for their arrogance and their impiety. So you see, until the high priest emerged, there was no guarantee God had accepted that God had forgiven their sins. He had to do it every year. Aaron, his successors, year after year, century after century. But Christ did this once for all. This is one of the great words of the letter of the Hebrews, once for all. So, three things then about his first coming. What did he do when he came the first time? The background, I see the, the, great, the great day of atonement. <clears throat> and the first thing, if you, if you look at verse um, 23, puzzling and difficult verse. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Christ came the first time not just to save souls. He did, and that is wonderful and glorious. He came to bring in a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. Why, you, you see, it was when on the Day of Atonement, the, the, the tabernacle itself and the altar had to be purified. Aaron himself had to have his sins forgiven. But it seems to be at least part of the point of this difficult verse is that um, the heaven itself had been afflicted by man's sin. Remember, biblical history revolves around two representative figures, Adam and Christ, and Paul in particular brings this out quite clearly in Romans and, and in Corinthians. When Adam sinned, not only did he and all of us become subject to death, but, the whole, but creation was under the curse. Creation was groaning, as Paul says. So when he comes, when he came again, and when he, well, sorry, when he came the first time, when he comes again, he is going to restore Eden, remove the curse and restore Eden. Now, there may be a hint as to what this public, puzzling verse means in the book of Revelation chapter 12. In that chapter, Satan is cast out of heaven because of the victory of Christ on the cross. And we are told that the followers of the Lamb defeated Satan by the blood of the Lamb. That doesn't mean, of course, repeating as a mantra, oh, Satan, I defeat you by the blood of the Lamb, but that the blood of the Lamb had this powerful effect of restoring creation itself. So, you see, it's nothing how big a thing it is. How big a thing Christmas is. It's not just about lowly cattle sheds and shepherds and so on. It's about the beginning of the restoring of creation. <laughs> I'm almost slightly amused when I read the last chapter of Hebrews, and he says, I have written to you only a short letter. I think if we had written a letter as long as Hebrews, we'd feel we'd done justice to our subject. But when you, when you think of the vastness of the subject, it is only a short letter, because that is the theme of all eternity. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain and redeemed us, but not just redeemed us, but redeemed the universe by the blood of the Lamb. In one of C.S. Lewis's science fiction novels, um, these are novels where he projects the gospel onto the background of the whole universe, and God, and God is, um, un, is known under the title of Mal Eldil. One of the characters there for the first time comes across blood, and in trembling amazement, he says, was this the substance 
with which Mal Eldo redeemed the worlds. See, it's not just redeeming us, it's redeeming the worlds. That's the first reason he came, put away, not just saving souls, but new creation. The second reason, of course, is the obvious one, to put away our sin. Uh, we are told verse, um, <clears throat> verse um, 26, he appeared once at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And then in verse 28, not to deal with sin. Sin is what separates us from God. Sin is what would prevent us entering the new creation. Nothing that defiles shall ever enter the holy city, says John at the, end, at the end of the Bible. Now, put away doesn't mean brushing under the carpet. Putting away means getting rid of. The psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he put our sins away from us. That means an infinite distance, of course. There is no geographical point called, called the east and another one called the west. So, when God forgives us, he completely removes our sins. Not just our guilt, but the sinful nature. Now, of course, that does not mean we become perfect. And John reminds us if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, that has to be done daily. There will never come a time on earth when we do not have to confess our sins. And that is what began when Jesus came to Bethlehem, but not just to Bethlehem, as I say, not just Christmas Day, it's Easter Day as well, of course. Um, Trace we the babe, says, says one of our carols who has retrieved our loss from his poor manger to his bitter cross, and that goes on to talking about singing with the heavenly hosts in, in the days to come. He's put away our sin, and this is, this is something that in a sense happened before the worlds were created, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. But it particularly happened at Calvary. To him who loves us, says John in Revelation, and has washed us from our sins. To him who loves us in eternal fact and has washed us. What, what happened at Calvary? In the middle years of the 20th century, there was an outstanding preacher in Edinburgh called J.S. Stewart, who also in his part of his time was professor of New Testament at Edinburgh University. And one day in one of his classes, an earnest American student said to him, Professor Stewart, when were you converted? And he replied, 2,000 years ago. Wonderful answer. Of course, it, Christ has to come into our lives now, but we must never make the event of us coming to Christ more important than the event of him coming to save us. He came not just to save souls, he came to put away our sins, and thirdly, he came to appear on our behalf. This is in, this is in verse 24. He entered heaven now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And this is the greatly neglected doctrine of the ascension You'll hear many sermons on the cross, many on the resurrection, very few on the ascension. But the ascension is a hugely important part of the gospel. What happened at the end of the 40 days? Jesus appeared for 40 days. What happened then? Where did he go? Did it all fizzle out then? No, the great importance of the ascension is that he went into glory to appear on our behalf. I mean, this is a staggering phrase. It's not at all staggering to imagine that he ascended into heaven. Not at all. It, it does not beg our belief that God, having raised him from the dead, that he should then ascend into... This is a wonderful phrase. On our behalf. Why did he go to glory? To appear in glory for us. That's why when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Since, says Hebrews earlier, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us come with confidence to the throne of grace. Are we crushed with memories of past sins which God has forgiven? 
and for which we can't forgive ourselves. Isn't this such a feature often of Christian life, this crushing sense of guilt? Well, look upward and see him there who made an end of all our sin. Doesn't make an end of some of our sin, doesn't make an end of the odd sin that's excusable, made an end of all our sins. Remember, all our sins were future when he died. When you came to him, he not only knew your past and your present sins, he knows our future sins. And that once for all sacrifice gives us grace to cover all our sins. Why did he come the first time? He came the first time to redeem the world. He came the first time to forgive our sins. He came the first time so he might be a great and merciful high priest. And the second question is, why will he come again? And our eyes at last shall see him through his own redeeming love for that child so dear and gentle is our Lord in heaven above. So our carols so regularly bring together these two coming. And this coming will not be in great humility. This coming will be in glorious majesty. Every eye will see him. And look at verse um, 27 and 28. Just as appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This time it is not to deal with sin. He dealt with that at Calvary. That is why that is why the doctrine of purgatory is so wrong. The doctrine of purgatory has an imperfect understanding of what Christ achieved at Calvary. Jesus paid it all, as the old hymn says. I don't have to pay a bit more. So why is he coming then? First of all, he is going to complete the work of defeating the devil. Now, this is picking up an earlier part in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. He came to undo the works of the devil. And that's so important because, after all, one of the reasons we feel such guilt and such despair is because the devil is, is, is at work. Chapter 2, verse 14, since the children took share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject the lifelong slavery. But you see, just as in this earthly life we continue to battle with sin and will continue to battle with sin, so we will continue to battle with the devil. Yet his first coming, Jesus defeated him, and his final defeat is certain. But as the chapter I already referred to, Revelation 12 says, he is even more deadly, not because he, he can win, but because he knows his time is short. And that's so important. That's so important to, to remember. So he'll complete the work because by defeating death, sin, death, and the devil, that will complete the work begun of redeeming the universe as well as redeeming souls. Secondly, he will come to judge the living and the dead. That is what Cranmer says once again in, in his great Advent prayer. Christ, having been offered, will not to deal with sin. He himself came to die, and that death was a judgment on sin. Not his own sins, but our sins, because he stood in for me. That is why the doctrine that's sometimes called penal substitution is so much at the heart of the gospel. Let me put it this way. When we talk about the death of Christ, we've got to be very, very careful. We don't try and reduce it to a formula. Why we're given various pictures in the Bible, justification, that takes us in, into the law court and, and an acquittal, redemption, that takes us into the slave mark, we are free from it, adoption, being made members of God's family. These are all metaphors, they're all pictures. But I believe substitution is not a metaphor, not a picture. This is what actually happened. Jesus stood in for you and Jesus stood in for me. 
just as happens at a football match, uh, a player doesn't go on to represent another player, he goes on to play in his own right, so to speak. And in a, in a play, when an actor isn't able to perform, then the, sub, then the understudy takes his place. That's what Jesus did. He died, death followed by judgment, judgment on the sins of humanity. In verse 27, interest, just the appointed a man to die once, and after this, the judgment, no room here for anything like reincarnation or the Buddhist idea of um, the transmigration of souls through, through many centuries. Death is followed by judgment, and the judge will be the one who died. Paul says to the Athenians, God has appointed a day which he will judge the world in righteousness, and he's raised the judge from the dead. Milton says in the Nativity Ode that the world's last session, a dreadful judge in middle air will spread his throne. And we'll sing in a few moments, every eye shall now behold him robed in glorious majesty. So he's coming to complete the work of defeating the devil. He is coming to judge the living and the dead. And finally, he is coming to bring about full salvation. Christ, having been offered once to spare the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those. Now, sometimes we talk about the three tenses of salvation, saved in the past, being saved in the present, and finally to be saved on the last, on, on the last day. But not until then. And I think that saves us from two errors. First of all, expecting too much in this world. Uh, some people, you, you know, the kind of prosperity gospel and its offshoots, that because Christ has saved us, Christ wants us to be happy, Christ wants us to have plenty of money, Christ wants our families to be beautiful, intelligent, and a credit to us, Christ wants, you know, this, that, and the next thing. None of these things are promised in Scripture. On the other hand, don't let's expect too little God, in His grace, gives us anticipations of the world to come. There are windows into eternity from time to time. Now, C.S. Lewis said, God gives us some pleasant holidays and wonderful resting places on our journey, but never allows us to mistake them for the real thing. So, it's full salvation, the full likeness of Christ. When we see Him, we will be like Him for we shall see him as he is. What about those who are eagerly waiting for him? Hmm. It's a bit alarming, isn't it? Did you get up this morning saying, maybe Christ will come today? I like to pretend I did, but I most certainly didn't. I got up thinking, what a dark, cold morning it is. Now, Christians often in an earlier generation would talk that way. But... I think the problem about that is it's placing too much emphasis on our feelings. You see, very often we don't feel that Christ came the first time. Very often we don't feel He died for our sins. Very often we don't feel that He rose again or is coming. I think, I think the point of this is much more those who, for whom this is the goal of their lives those who believe that the, the final verdict is not given in this world, that the final reality of our salvation is yet to come. There will be moments, of course, when people do look forward to the coming of Christ. But I think it's far more to do with this settled conviction, because this is what keeps us going in the Christian life, the fact that there is a goal. You can put up with an awful lot if you know that things are going to work out in the end, and not just a vain hope, well, everything will be just fine, but in another event. Remember the gospel story centered around events, the coming at Bethlehem, the death on Calvary, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension to heaven, the sending of the Spirit, and the coming for which we look. Not primarily feelings then, but the goal to which we are looking. And to quote Cranmer once again as we finish, so that when he shall come again in his glorious majesty, we may not be ashamed before him at his coming.
Amen. Let's pray. Father, may the Christ who made the worlds, the Christ at the heart of the Scriptures, the Christ who came in great humility at Bethlehem and who will come again in glorious majesty, may that Christ be the center of our lives and particularly at this Christmas. May we indeed, um, through all the other things we do, may we indeed look to him and look forward to his coming again in glory. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Now, in a moment or two, we're going to meet around the Lord's table. This is open to all who love the Lord Jesus Christ, and um, we invite everyone to share with us around the table. When the bread and wine is being passed, if you'd rather not take it, please don't feel embarrassed. Just simply pass it on to, to the person beside you. We're going to sing two verses of a hymn before communion. We're going to sing the great Advent hymn of Wesley 511, which brings together the comings. Lo, he comes with clouds descending once for favored sinners slain. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 of this. Once we've sung this, will you please take your seats because we'll, we'll be going straight into communion after that. 511 verses 1 and 2. Now, as we come around the Lord's table, some words from the book of Revelation. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, exiled in old age on Patmos, sees a glorious figure and hears his voice. He writes this, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, and with a golden sash around his chest. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death 
and of Hades. And John also writes, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was and who is and who is to come, the Almighty. So as we have fed on Christ in the, in the Scriptures, now we feed on him by faith in bread and wine. So let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you that you created heaven and earth, that you created humanity in your image, and that you purpose to bring in a new heaven and a new earth, filled with a redeemed people who will show your glory. Even when we went our own way, you sent prophets and messengers to call us back to you. Finally, you came yourself in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, one with you who became one of us and is one of us still. We praise you for his birth in great humility, for his life anticipating the new creation as he healed the, as he healed the sick, as he forgave sins, as he freed the oppressed, and even stormed death's citadel itself. We praise you for his death, that once for all sacrifice, which can never be repeated, and to which nothing can be added. For his resurrection and his defeating of the powers of death, for his ascension into glory, for his sending the Spirit, and the sure promise of his coming again in glory. We come to this table as sinners. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may truly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Apostles tell us that the Lord Jesus Christ, the night on which he was betrayed, took bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you, all of you eat it. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, all of you drink it. The Apostle Paul tells us, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, brothers and sisters, come not because we must, but because we may. Not because we are strong, but because we are weak. Come because we love the Lord a little and want to love him more. But above all, let us eat and drink because he loves us and gave himself for us. Now, our usual custom here is when we receive the bread to eat it as we receive it, but to keep the cup and we'll all drink together. So let's drink together. Amen. <clears throat> oh, let's pray. Father, you have fed us today on Jesus Christ, the bread of life, as he has come to us in the words of Scripture and in bread and wine. Many of us have had the privilege of sitting round his table many times over the years, 
some perhaps more recently, perhaps even someone here for the first time. And at this moment, too, we thank you for all those, many of whom we know and love, the great cloud of witnesses who once sat around your table on earth and now rejoice with you around your table in heaven and with whom, in this Lord Jesus, we are forever united. And so we praise you, Lord, and as we look back and look up and look forward, we echo the words with which the Bible ends, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now we finish our service by singing the final three verses of 511, verse 3 in particular, carrying on very fittingly from the Lord's table, those deep wounds of cross and passion still His dazzling body bears. Verses 3 to 5 of 511. to God our Father, whose purposes for us do not end in death, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who entered our world, that we might enter His, and to the Holy Spirit, who continually works in our hearts, preparing us for that great day, be all honor, glory, and love. May their power surround us, their grace sustain us, and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory. Amen.